Headlines on global business. The 2023 Summer Doubles kicks off Tuesday in Tianjin to promote entrepreneurship and seek post-pandemic recovery recipes. Global Business talks to World Economic Forum Managing Director to see how summer doubles can help the world find a path to get out of low growth. And leaders of Barbados, New Zealand, Mongolia, Vietnam are visiting Beijing to boost ties. From CGTN headquarters in Beijing, this is Global Business. I'm Jun Jufeng. The 2023 World Economic Forum annual meeting of the new champions, better known as Summer Doubles, will kick off tomorrow in Tianjin and run until Thursday. About 1,500 leaders from both the public and private sectors from more than 90 countries and regions will take part in a wide range of discussions concerning the global economy as well as that of China during the three-day event. The theme this year is entrepreneurship as a driving force for the global economy. For more, let's cross to my colleague Lily Liu on the ground for more highlights of this year's Summer Doubles. Hi there, Zheng Feng. I'm right now by the Haikou River in Tianjin. This is right in the heart of the city of Tianjin. So we all know about this. It's a big day tomorrow where Winner the Chinese Premier will be attending the Summer Davos Forum and deliver a keynote speech. He will then meet with WEF Chairman Klaus Schwab and other foreign attendees and then have talks with representatives of global entrepreneurs. Uh, the Premier has just concluded his trip to Germany and France. We know about that where he caught on the local business communities to uphold economic globalization and win-win cooperation. We will be closely following the Premier's speech tomorrow uh, to look for possible clues on how China's economic vitality can synergize with the global recovery. And also, when the Winter Davos Forum at the beginning of this year was held, it was not long after China eased its COVID restrictions. And ever since then, China's economic activity has been bouncing back. We saw pent-up consumer demand was released, and then especially for the services sector, and then some improvement in the housing sector as well with much policy support. Uh, the first quarter of China's economy saw a 4.5% economic expansion, and it is widely expected that China will remain the growth engine of the world economy in year 2023. So the summer Davos was paused for three years due to the pandemic. And for the city of Tianjin, it is now welcoming back this big event in five years. On my way here to this place, I was chatting with my taxi driver and he knows about the forum. He said the city knows about the forum. And he also knows there's another Davos in Europe, somewhere in Europe, he says. And he asked me, what is the difference between those two platforms? Well, we all know the winter Davos in Switzerland focuses on a broader scope of global issues. Well, the Summer Davos here has a particular emphasis on fast-growing and emerging businesses, technology pioneers and young global leaders. Hence, many are seeing this as a platform for fostering dialogue between established global leaders and their newer and emerging counterparts. And I know our colleague Julia is standing by in Europe. So I know, Julia, you have been to the Davos Davos. How do you understand the link between those two platforms? Summer Davos is also known, officially known as the 14th annual meeting of the new champions and this as you mentioned will take place from 27th to 29th of June and of course this uh, Summer Davos is organized by the World Economic Forum which uh, held its forum in, in Davos uh, in uh, Switzerland in January. Well, the forum in Davos was a platform for business leaders and global leaders to exchange views over the biggest issues facing the world uh, in 2023. And the main outcome of the uh, Davos forum was that the global economic situation, the global economic outlook is, not, uh, is looking better than was feared. So, in fact, looking much better than was feared. Uh, of course, also the war in Ukraine, uh, trade issues, climate. There were also big topics at the Davos Forum, as well as technologies. And China declared itself open for business uh, during Davos. And this will certainly be a big issue, a big issue in Tianjin as well. So uh, this summer, Davos will welcome 1,500 participants from around 90 countries. And the theme there, as uh, you mentioned, the entrepreneurship, the driving force of the global economy. And China's premier, of course, will also, Li Qiang, will make an address there. 
example, China in the global context will be discussed, China's future will be examined, and the Chinese economy's role in the global economy will be discussed. So indeed, some interesting days are coming up in Tianjin in the next, uh, this week. Yes, indeed, Julia. We are crossing over, actually, from the mountains in Europe to the seasides in China. We know both Dali and Tianjin, both are alternate locations, and they are both coastal cities. So from the snowfalls uh, in Davos to here, the nice sea breeze we're getting, the summer, thunder, uh, even some of the thunderstorms we're getting here in, in China in summer, uh, these crossovers actually bring together great minds and that we hope that this year we will discover more about the resilience and innovative spirit of entrepreneurs. I am particularly interested in getting to know how these enterprises can harness on the great rhinos, they can capitalize on the global challenges. That's something truly exciting, right? And more importantly, how they can build up a business that is both socially friendly, beneficial, uh, profitable, and also something that can help us to shape a better future. Well, that's it from my end for now. Back to you, Jingfeng. Lulu, what a beautiful view uh, behind you. I guess it's the Haihe River of Tianjin, which is very famous uh, locally. And I look forward to your report in the next yeah. three days, full of events, full of discussions uh, with uh, over 1,500 participants. Thank you so much. Look forward to more reports from you and your colleagues. Now let's take a look at the history of summer doubles and how relations between the World Economic Forum and China have evolved over the years. The World Economic Forum is a non-profit foundation based in Geneva, Switzerland. The idea was conceived by German professor Klaus Schwab in 1971. The forum is best known for its annual meeting at the end of January in a mountain resort in Davos. The meeting brings together thousands of top businessmen, international political leaders, economists, celebrities and journalists to discuss the most pressing issues facing the world. In 2007, the foundation established the annual meeting of the new champions, also called Summer Davos. The gathering is held annually in China and alternating between Dalian and Tianjin. The forum brings together 1,500 influential top players of what the foundation calls global growth companies, primarily from rapidly growing emerging countries such as China, India, Russia, Mexico and Brazil. The meeting also engages with the next generation of global leaders from fast-growing regions and competitive cities, as well as technology pioneers from around the globe. The history between WEF and China can be traced back to 1979, when the European Management Forum, which is the WEF's former name, officially set up a cooperative relationship with the Chinese government in Beijing. Two years later, the forum co-hosted the first international symposium on business management with the China Enterprise Confederation. From 1983, China started to send delegations to the forum. These groups include high-level representatives from both the political arena and business community. My colleague Guan Xing is also in Tianjin. She earlier interviewed Mirak Dusek, Managing Director of the World Economic Forum. Mr. Dusek said he sees three horizons of growth. We are really in a situation of low growth globally. Now, having said that, uh, we, of course, uh, need to make sure that this meeting is used to look at how do we get out of this. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a certain sense of agency in terms of what are the pathways to grow uh, in the near term, in the near term, mid term and long term. And mm -hmm. so we really look at those three horizons of growth. Mm -hmm. And the first one, the most immediate one, is really the fact that we are uh, in China, we are in Asia. If you look at uh, the analysis again, uh, recent that was recently put out, seven, up to 70% of the growth that we're seeing globally is coming from Asia Pacific. Mm. So uh, we need to be aware of the growth markets. Now, mm. the mid-term horizon of growth, as we see it, mm. and it's at the heart of this meeting, it's called the new champions, yeah. is entrepreneurship and innovation. Mm -hmm. And we are saying that we need a new generation of entrepreneurship and innovation. And the third horizon of growth that we see, and that's why we are also here, uh, is around, It's of course, we need to work on it every day. And let's face it, we have 
headwinds in terms of some geoeconomic developments. Yeah. But we need to work on cooperation because mm. if if you do not work on cooperation, you will not be able to get, to get out properly and in a sustainable way out of the global growth environment globally. In a nutshell, we have these three horizons of growth and of course they're relevant mm. also to, as we see it at least, to to the to the to the Chinese economy and how how uh, all, along all, all those three axes, of course, kind of the near term, mid term, long term, um, it's so important. You, we are mm. talking almost a twenty trillion dollar economy with mm. China, mm. and so if if the predictions are now for China to grow over five percent this year, that's adding one trillion one trillion dollars into the uh, into the global economy mm. this year. So it's really very pivotal. That all these opportunities and realize that are realized despite the headwinds, and that's mm -hmm. why we're here. As you watch China's economy from close up, what do you make of its ability to navigate these risks? So it's important because I think we need to take very seriously the fact that uh, we ha we have not had enough dialogue, and we have also not had enough opportunities to learn about each other. This is. Uh, for us, uh, of course, the first time we're gathered here in person yeah. for a global meeting with the World Economic Forum. We believe that we need to have public-private cooperation and mm. partnerships to move the needle on net zero, to move the needle on on how trade can contribute to net zero, move the needle on how can we actually successfully um, enable an energy transition mm. that will be both sustainable um, but they will also be providing um, uh, secure um, energy supply, and that will be inclusive. The Summer Davos Forum in Tianjin will focus on the power of innovation and entrepreneurship, and organizations say they hope to help move the world towards a fairer, greener, and more resilient global economy. Dan Kai sit down with the chief commercial officer for Lego to discuss the role entrepreneurship can play in achieving common goals. I'm curious to hear your insights on the essence of entrepreneurship. Okay. As someone leading a globally renowned yes. brand like Lego, how would you define entrepreneurship? Yeah, I think from my observation that the best entrepreneurs have a certain purpose, right? They they can define a purpose that they are really passionate about and they share that purpose with their employee base and that galvanizes everybody towards a common goal. So at the Lego group, right, and it was founded by one person, one entrepreneur 90 years ago, um, the, the noble goal, the purpose, is to be, bring learning through play to kids around the world. We now say um, that our purpose is to develop and inspire the builders of tomorrow. And regardless what function somebody has at the Lego group, whether they're in finance or operations or the legal team or the commercial team or the marketing team, everybody has that one purpose. Everybody's marching in the same direction. So I think for me, that's the key for an entrepreneur, right? Being very clear, what's your purpose? And then galvanizing an entire team to work every day towards that purpose and not going off on tangents, you know, not getting distracted by other things, but being really focused everybody working together towards that purpose, whatever it might be. We know that the current economic global landscape is facing multiple pressures yes. and it's crucial for entrepreneurs, for business persons actually worldwide to provide growth momentum. Yes. Under that global context, what type of entrepreneurship do you think is necessary? Yeah. Mm. So I think um, we need sort of bifocal leaders, right? Leaders who are looking at the long term always focused on what we need to achieve in the long term, but remaining very flexible and agile in the short term. You know, I like to say that we need a long-term vision to keep us moving towards something, but we need the short term to give us like the oxygen to keep us going on the long-term journey. We can't ignore today's um, commercial results, right? If we don't deliver commercial results in the short term, we won't have the profits to build for the long term. On the other hand, we can't be so focused on the short term that we forget the long term. So I really think it's this bifocal approach, remaining very conscious of what we have to do for the long term and always building towards that while still keeping some accountability and some agility to deliver the short term results. Watching Global Business, come up next. 
Leaders of Barbados, New Zealand, Mongolia and Vietnam are visiting Beijing to boost ties. Foster entrepreneurship, reinvigorate innovation, transition into green development are among a diverse range of topics at this year's Summer Davos. Faced with an increasingly complicated geopolitical landscape and frequent financial volatility, policymakers and leading industry leaders share their insights on the most pressing global issues. How to unleash the full potential of small and medium-sized enterprises? How to reap the benefit of AI while mitigating its risks? How to reboot the global economy in a post-pandemic era towards a sustainable future for all? Join us for a special coverage of the 14th annual meeting of the new champions, only on CGTN. Russian President Vladimir Putin signed a decree on Monday extending the special economic measures signed on December 27, 2022 to December 31, 2023. The special economic measures were introduced due to the price limit imposed by Western countries on Russia, crude oil and petroleum products. Now, New Zealand Prime Minister Chris Hipkins starts his week-long trip in China, the first of its kind by a New Zealand leader since 2019. Hipkins touched down in Beijing late Sunday, leading one of the largest delegations the country has ever sent on a mission abroad. The 29 delegates represent a wide range of sectors, including tourism and education. On Monday, Prime Minister Hipkins took part in a series of business events hosted by New Zealand's embassy in Beijing. He is also expected to attend a summer doubles forum in Tianjin this week. Meanwhile, China's Commerce Minister Wang Wenwentao met his New Zealand counterpart Demi O'Connor from the delegation. Wang said China will capitalize on Hipkins' visit to further boost bilateral trade with New Zealand. O'Connor said the delegation to China aims to strengthen cooperation in agriculture and food security. In an address to the New Zealand embassy earlier today, Hipkins said the main purpose of the visit is to boost trade. The following footage is shared by New Zealand's national broadcaster TVNZ. Take a look. The purpose of our visit is to send one crystal clear message, and that is that New Zealand's open for business, um, and that we value our relationship with China, uh, with everybody in it, uh, with other businesses in it, um, and that we see huge potential to continue to grow and strengthen and widen and deepen that relationship. Uh, and our presence here today and the fact that we have such a strong delegation here today uh, I think is a real sign of our commitment and our willingness uh, to put in the work to make all of that happen. So uh, my goal as Prime Minister in, uh, in bringing this delegation uh, to Beijing and then ultimately uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, uh, to Shanghai eventually and then um, home to New Zealand is to try and open doors, create opportunities um, and really strengthen the, the close bond that already exists between the two countries. Trade relations between China and New Zealand have enjoyed steady growth ever over the past several decades. China is New Zealand's largest trading partner, export market and source of imports. Bilateral trading in 2022 was more than 25 billion US dollars, up 1.8% on a yearly basis. New Zealand was the first Western developed country to sign a free trade agreement with China back in 2008. In 2015, New Zealand joined the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank among the first developed nations to back China's efforts in a regional development. And in 2017, the country became the first in the Western world to sign a memorandum of understanding with China on the Belt and Road Initiative. In 2022, the protocol on upgrading the free trade agreement between the two countries came into effect. New Zealand Prime Minister Chris Hipkins is aiming to promote a range of business-to-business -business partnerships during his trade mission to China this week. As China's largest source of imported dairy products, New Zealand may promote emerging sectors like health and wellness as well as traditional goods. Our reporter Owen Poland has more from Auckland. 
It's some of the best grazing land in the world, and the organic milk that these cows produce is being exported on daily flights to China. You know, it can be in China um, in a matter of days. Green Valley Dairies is a family-owned business that farms 3,500 cows, and they're processing fresh milk for the Chinese market from their own factory. And this gives us the ability to track the raw milk directly from the cow through the factory to the end user. New Zealand's biggest dairy exporter is Fonterra, a cooperative of 9,000 farmers that generates annual revenues of more than 14 billion US dollars. And it's planning to tap into China's emerging well-being market with a new range of nutritional products. And so there's a lot of opportunity for us, especially as the Chinese consumer becomes more focused on health and wellness, um, to be able to offer these solutions um, through our customers to consumers. New Zealand has around 6 million dairy cows. That's more than one for every human. And around 40% of the milk that they produce gets exported to China in products ranging from infant formula to cheese, even whipped cream. Infant formula is one of the most lucrative categories, but there's also rising demand for adult milk powders. You've got an elderly population that needs servicing with nutritious product, and you've got a market there that uh, really enjoys buying these products from New Zealand. And small businesses like Green Valley Dairies hope that Chinese consumers buy into New Zealand's clean green image and the focus on sustainability. Yeah, I think we're going to see a stronger demand for organic and, um, and exactly knowing where your, your milk has come from, you know, grass-fed, pasture-based, this, this very thing that we're seeing here. This week's trade mission to China is also seen as a way to enhance future cooperation. We want to make sure that the trade lanes remain open, uh, that there is beneficial exchange of ideas uh, and, of course, the wonderful products that New Zealand can bring to China. Owen Poland, CGTN, Auckland. For more discussion on China New Zealand ties, we're joined by Zhou Mi, Research Fellow at the Chinese Academy of International Trade and Economic Cooperation. Thanks for joining us, uh, Mr. Zhou. In which areas will the New Zealand leaders visit to China? A very long visit, I have to say, a week long visit. Uh, how would that promote bilateral cooperation? I think, first of all, that uh, he came here after the COVID policy has changed. So for several years, we haven't this kind of uh, discussion and the meeting with the other side. So he came here to see by his own eyes and also the delegate to see what has happened in China and how the development of China society has improved. As he said that uh, the trade is one of the priorities for New Zealand to improve as for the first two uh, seasons or uh, two, uh, uh, two autumn, uh, sorry, uh, two seasons this year, New Zealand's export is not performing so good, so he is trying to improve the bilateral trade by improving that. Well, and uh, he also wants to go to somewhere uh, like Shanghai and also Tianjin to attend the local cooperation, which is a very important with not only by the state-to-state -state cooperation, but also by the locality cooperation. It's a very important time for him to see some signals about the cooperation willingness and establish a better mechanism for developing cooperation. Mm. New Zealand is the first developed country to sign into the Belt and Road Initiative that China promotes. Uh, what kind of role does New Zealand play in the initiative and why has New Zealand been uh, constantly, I mean, very consistently friendly to China? Actually, New Zealand is uh, not a very big country, so it depends too much about the international market. So that is their very firm uh, confidence that it will uh, try to improve the globalization. So for the first and the most important things for the Belt and Road Initiative Corporation, New Zealand want to cooperate in the interconnections, not only the connections between New Zealand and China, but also between China and the other Belt and Road countries and regions. New Zealand want to play a very important role. And the second that we know New Zealand is a developed economy, so it has many ideas about new things, about the rules of the digital economy, the green economy. So it can play a very important role in improving the rules and some mechanism in the Belt and Road region for this kind of uh, corporations. So I believe that uh, both sides are trying to do more to expand the space for the development, uh, both for China and New Zealand, 
economies, and it is very important also for other economies in the world. Right. 2024 will mark the 10th anniversary of the China-New Zealand Comprehensive Strategic Partnership. The, uh, the two countries have also had uh, lots of other relationships in terms of trade and relations. And uh, I think the two countries have been very close in economic relations. What's the potential for further uh, bilateral economic ties? Actually, uh, in my understanding that New Zealand and China can expand the cooperation not only in the traditional ways of recovery from the impact of the COVID, while still trying to improve more things about the new ideas, like for the, uh, for the e-commerce, for something to do with the artificial intelligence. Well, I have to say that New Zealand is uh, quite different from China. Well, we see that the ambassadors of New Zealand last year went to several provinces like in Guangxi and trying to pay a more visit to find more opportunities in the different levels of cooperation. So uh, for, you know, for these two countries, we have established uh, such an important relationship. We should try to strengthen and make better utilize of all the mechanism to improve better certainty to the world, trying to provide better room for the innovations. Thank you so much. That was Zhou Mi, Research Fellow at the Chinese Academy of International Trade and Economic Cooperation. Now, not only New Zealand, but also Prime Ministers of Barbados, Mongolia and Vietnam also on official visits to China. As a close partner of China, Barbados has seen a sound and steady bilateral trade volume growth. In the first five months of this year, bilateral import and export trade volume reached 491 million yuan, or about 68 million US dollars, and more than 25% year on year. Exports to Barbados increased by 35% year on year to almost 445 million yuan. In 2022, bilateral trade volume for the year uh, was nearly 1.3 billion yuan. Among them, imports from Barbados surged 80% on a yearly basis to over 170 million yuan. With that, we'll wrap up this edition of Global Business here on CityTN. Thanks for watching. I'm Jujufeng. CityTN continues with more news and views. Stay with us.